Good evening all. So this is one of our sessions um, brought to you by Ultimate Access Knowledge Hub. And today you've got myself, Andrew Dialwis and Kasun, uh, who's joining us from all the way from Kazakhstan. Welcome Kasun, thanks for your time. And just to give you a brief uh, intro of Kasun, Kasun is a CIMA member as well um, and has been a FCMA for a very long time and also has been the president of one of the um, branches in Canada. So Kasun has got over 20 years of oil and gas experience and we are really indeed very fortunate to have Kasun join us and talk us through this presentation um, a blue ocean strategy. I know, Kasun, it is um, a favorite topic of yours. Um, and, and a little bit about myself. I'm Andrew, I'm based in the UAE. Uh, I'm one of the lecturers with Ultimate Access. And uh, this is also a very um, interesting topic for me. So I would like to hand over to Kasun to talk a little bit about himself for two minutes and then I will do the uh, the first part of the presentation and then Kasun will take over. So Kasun, just a little bit of an intro from yourself. Yeah, thank you, uh, Andrew. I'm, I'm uh, indeed privileged to uh, to be one of the one of the speakers. Um, as Andrew said, I've got about 20 years of uh, uh, experience uh, working in uh, in um, uh, the oil and gas industry, primarily uh, with uh, Shell Petroleum. I've been uh, about uh, 10 years of that has been on the upstream side and another 10 years on the downstream side, downstream marketing. Um, pretty much worked uh, all over the world, Canada, um, UAE, Africa, Far East, uh, uh, Netherlands, uh, and, and now in uh, the CIS uh, countries. So that's that's very briefly about myself. As, and as Anju said, uh, I'm, a, I'm a FCMA. Uh, and as well as a CMA from uh, from Canada, so that that's it. Look forward to uh, chatting later. All right, thank you, Kasun. So, blue ocean strategy is something that um, that's a, a very interesting topic when it came up in two thousand five, and is still relevant in today's uh, day as well. So, what is this the whole thing about blue ocean strategy? Right, it's create uncontested market space and make competition irrelevant. That's interesting, isn't it? Well, what is this uncontested market space? Well, who brought this up really? There were two people who actually was instrumental in bringing this whole concept, right? And they were uh, Chan Kim and Ranema Bourne, both uh, professors from INSEAD um, Chan is from Korea and uh, Rene is from the US and they are uh, professors as I said from INSEAD and they uh, coined this thought and brought us this concept of blue ocean strategy something really revolutionary I would urge you to go and google this uh, blue ocean strategy and there's a lot of material on it it's amazing it's an amazing concept because it kind of breaks all the rules the conventional thinking how we're trained to think right and a little bit of um, what is what are the uh, the principles around it you can see a red and a blue we will talk a little bit about the red as we go through the presentation but first the blue so this is where we would like to be like to be in the blue ocean right and if what it says is look across alternative industries now when we are looking at if you're trying to analyze industries we are trained to think well what's your competition doing right what's his pricing should we compete on price are we going to reduce our pricing you know a price war you see this price war happening all the time right now with this thinking they came up with 
Well, look across alternative industries. What do you mean by alternate industries? Now, let us come up with, give you an example of this, right? Let's look at, um, let's think about this. You have um, one night out that you want to go out and you will think of, well, should I look at going into a restaurant or should I go to the cinema, right? So you have two alternatives or maybe three or four, right? Now, uh, well, the objective here is that you're going to go out and enjoy a night out. How you do it, those are the different things that you've got. Go to a movie, go to a restaurant or something else, right? So what they looked at, saying, well, look at the other alternatives, right? Look at what the customer wants. Where does the customer, what does the customer want really, right? What is the customer's objective? May, the objective was just to go out, have a good time, right? So that is what about alternate industries. And then you, I hope that example kind of ex gave you an example, you know, it, it provided that example of how to look at alternate industries, right? Now let us look at the second point. Right? Look across strategic groups within the industry. What does that mean, right? Strategic groups. Now, one company that has done this in an amazing way is a company called Curves, right? This company was formed in 1995 in the fitness industry. You and I both know how saturated this fitness industry is, right? How many um, clubs, how many uh, kind of homegrown uh, clubs are there, personal trainers, etc., etc. This is a very, very saturated industry. Everybody is in, into fitness, especially during beginning of the year, as we all know, right? Now, well, what did these guys do? They looked at who are the traditional um, health and fitness uh, companies. What do they offer? They looked at that. And they found, well, they seem to offer similar things. You can call it different names. You can call it fitness first. You can call it pink, blue, black. But they're all offering the same thing. So if they're offering the same thing, what's happening? You, you're actually, the rivalry within the market is quite fierce, right? Because you're, it is on price. That's all that you got you're competing on price so at the one end of the spectrum you got the traditional health and fitness clubs uh, which offered you know full service gyms the spas etc etc right and then you had in the other end of the spectrum the homegrown home fitness kind of situation right that is home exercise programs well, what did Curves do? They actually selected a segment of the market. They said, well, let's just focus on the women and what they really want, right? And by just doing that, they were able to create a new market, right? Create a massive market, more than 6,000 locations across the world, over 2 million members and over 1 billion in revenue. That's a massive success story, right? So like that, in all of these segments, how, there are examples and ways on how we can create and go and be in that blue ocean, creating a new market space, right? So I'm Due to the interest of time, I'm not going into a lot of examples in all these um, six areas. Kasun is going to give you uh, some great examples uh, where they have used the Blue Ocean strategy and how they've become really successful. 
these are some of the um, principles, models that you can use. Now I'm going into a next model, right? Again, this is the grid. A grid where you can ask some sometimes difficult questions and very uh, good questions because you need to ask from your group, from your company, the key senior executives, what should we eliminate, right? What should we reduce? What am I going to raise and create, right? These are so important, these four elements, right? Because with that, you're going to create a new value curve that was never there, right? That was never ever there in this, in this industry. So by eliminating non-value added activities, reducing the non-value added activities, which is not important to your customer and which is adding cost to your company, right? You, you're reducing all this and by that you're creating cost reduction, right? By raising and creating new elements, you're creating a differentiation, a new product, a new service and then well, you've got a new value, right? An amazing new value that you've created what your customers, your current and your future customers would love to have, right? Now we're going into some examples that Kasun is going to go through with you and some very colorful, interesting examples. Over to you, Kasun. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for that int introduction and the... And the uh sort of the background to what we're going to be talking about in the next uh, few minutes. So the first example that I have is uh, uh, du Sol, uh, which is basically in the industry uh, of, uh, of circus. So Cirque is, uh, Cirque is Canada's largest cultural export uh, created by a group of street performers way back in 1984. Uh, Cirque productions have been seen by over 40 million people across 90 cities around the world. In less than 20 years, Cirque achieved revenues that took Ringing Brothers, the global champion of, of circus industry, more than 100 years to achieve. So you can see that they did achieve the same results in one-fifth of the time. This was achieved in a declining industry by focusing, as Anju mentioned earlier, not on outcompeting your existing competitors, but by creating new market space and expanding your industry boundaries. Their original market was primarily children and their new market was adults and corporate clients. So let's go into the next slide and, and see what they actually did to be able to get to um, these phenomenal uh, results within short, such a short period of time. So let me explain um, the, uh, the strategy canvas. So what you find on the, uh, on the X axis, the, the bottom axis is uh, what we call the market uh, factor. So what are your key uh, market drivers that you would you would identify in, in your own industry? The red uh, lines that you see are the current competition, your existing traditional uh, circus uh, providers. The blue line is what Cirque basically created uh, for themselves. And Anju initially mentioned about eliminating certain activities that don't add value, uh, reducing certain activities that don't bring revenue, um, and raising and creating uh, new activities that changes your uh, value cost equation. 
So let's look at some of the uh, activities that uh, were eliminated. So in a traditional um, uh, circus, you would have animal shows, uh, star performers, and multiple uh, show arenas. So multiple show arenas means you will have three or four uh, circuses happening at the same time on the same stage uh, where people can focus on, on, on what, they, what they want. So what uh, uh, CERC uh, did was they looked at the, uh, the value cost drivers and found that having animal shows, having star performers, uh, and multiple shows didn't bring in any additional revenue. Uh, all it did was increase the cost structure uh, of their industry. So what did they do? They eliminated the animal shows. The animals were the highest, most expensive to cart around. Insurance, uh, feeding them, housing them was, was pretty uh, expensive. They got rid of star performers because the star performers in terms of a circus were trivial next to movie stars. Multiple shows were, were taken out. Aisle concessions were taken out. What did they reduce? So these were the ones that were eliminated. They reduced but did not eliminate the fun and humor, the thrill and danger. They reduced that but didn't eliminate. So what did they what did they raise? They raised the unique venues. So these venues are permanent tents that that were put up. The uh, what did what did they create? I think this is the most interesting thing because this is where you really start expanding your market boundaries. This is where you look at alternate industries. This is where you start to start to merge. Uh, merge the uh, market factors of two industries. So what they created was they created a theme uh, for their circus. They refined the environment in which these were held. They had multiple productions and they brought in something which is very unique to theater, which was artistic, music and dance. So what they did through this whole uh, exercise of, of redefining market boundaries was they brought in focus around what they wanted to do. There was divergence uh, from what their competitors were what, uh, was uh, offering. So they brought in something between a theater and a, and a circus and that's how they expanded the market uh, boundaries. Through that, they were able to charge higher prices and, and thereby increase their unit profitability uh, and, and uh, appeal to a slightly different market segment that was, that was never in the existing, existing market structure. So this is what uh, CERC basically uh, did in order to, in order to outperform the, the competition and cr recreate market boundaries and to expand their market market share. Now I have to probably say here that there is there is no problem offering having a having a sort of a full option offer. You can offer everything that you want as long as it brings in market share and revenues. The moment it does not bring in market share and revenue, you are basically oversupplying uh, the the customers. And and this is where you you really start looking at your market factors and saying, you know, what is it that doesn't add value to my bottom line? What, what adds value? What is the value to the customer? And then you, you, start, uh, you start playing around with those, uh, with those parameters. Kasun, uh, just, just to add there, I mean, their pricing is not the cheapest, isn't it? The ticket prices are quite expensive, right? They are. They are expensive. And also, I think the other aspect is the circus was kind of uh, focused towards kids, but this Cirque du Soleil, it was more actually kids as well as they went into a different market, which is, of course, the adults, isn't it? Absolutely. And this goes back to exactly what you mentioned earlier. 
someone wants to have a good evening yes. and you've got two, three options. Either you go out to eat, you go to a movie or you do something else. Here what they did was they really looked across that industry of, of alternatives yes. and brought in certain, uh, certain uh, uh, entertainment factors from different industries um, to, to, to fit into their model. Yes, thank you. So I'll go to the next slide. Yes, please. So let's look at uh, a slightly uh, different uh, industry now, the airline industry. We know that except for a few airlines around the world, uh, out of probably hundreds of airlines uh, that we currently have globally, not all airlines are doing well particularly not the North American airlines. You, you get a few in, in, the, in the European world, the Middle Eastern and maybe a few Far Eastern carriers that are making money, but particularly in, in uh, North America, not many of the airlines are making money. And now you find Southwest Airlines, which uh, has been profitable for 43 years. That's, that's, that's an extremely... Uh, extremely impressive uh, track record. So let's go into uh, the uh, strategy canvas of Southwest Airlines to see what they did. Uh, and this is probably a much easier industry for us to understand because at some point in time, we've all been through an airport, we've all traveled from one country to another, um, and we know what the traditional airlines offer. Yeah, Higher price, we get a meal, we get to go to the lounge, provided you bought you are in the you bought the right ticket. Um, you you get to choose your uh, seats uh, on the aircraft, and if you if you fly, you are put, uh, probably flying to a hub location. So if you are flying within Europe, for, for example, you fly to uh, either Frankfurt, uh, Heathrow, one of those locations before you can get to another another location. So what? <clears throat> and so what South, uh, uh, Southwest did was they looked at what are my customers' alternatives. And uh, very quickly they identified that they were also competing with the, uh, with the vehicles, the cars, because the cars were much more uh, flexible uh, in terms of departure time, uh, affordable, uh, and they could go from point to point. So having identified the sort of the alternate industries and identifying who their competitors were, they were able to expand their, their market uh, boundaries. And, and therefore what Southwest did was they looked again at their value cost equation and, and very quickly came to the conclusion that basically eliminating meals, uh, lounges, seating choices, and hub activities would really take a lot of costs out with no value um, erosion for in the minds of the customer. And they ramped up uh, the friendly service, uh, the speed, which was uh, basically, they said, frequent departures, point to point. So if you are a, if you are a uh, business traveler, you got to your destination quicker uh, than if you were to take a traditional airline. Uh, improved their improved their friendly service, and that's how they maintained uh, their their um, profitability across uh, across multiple multiple years. And again, there is nothing wrong in offering all of those things that. The normal traditional airlines offer. So if you take Emirates or any of the other airlines, uh, you know you pay a high price. You get a uh, meal on 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 flight. You get uh, lounge access, seating choices, all that. There's nothing wrong as long as, again, as I said before, it adds to your bottom line. And how does your customer perceive that in terms of the price they pay? What value do they attach? Yeah. So, so this is the model that Southwest uh, uh, Airlines uh, adopted, and you can see this same sort of uh, model being adopted by uh, EasyJet and, and some of the uh, low-cost uh, low airlines. 
and and hence uh, the reason for most of these airlines to be uh, much more profitable than uh, than uh, the the traditional uh, long haul um, uh, big jets that that most uh, most companies operate Okay, so in terms of uh, a quick uh, summary of uh, of what we looked at in conjunction with what uh, Anju covered at the beginning, you get red ocean, which means you are competing with your existing competitors, fighting for market share in a known market space. From that, you move to a blue ocean strategy, which is unknown market space, few competitors expanding the boundaries of the market and creating a new market share. So you're going away from, you're adding more value to, to the customer uh, at an affordable price and thereby entering a completely uncharted market uh, space and this is one of the one of the difficulties of actually creating a blue ocean strategy is because it's completely uncharted and therefore you need a, a number of brainstorming sessions uh, before you can before you could uh, create a blue ocean strategy because simply because uh, most organizations don't have uh, the uh, the knowledge the capability to think beyond a red ocean strategy. It's a different type of culture as well, Kasun, isn't it? I mean, you need to have that culture uh, to think outside the box and, you know, go and be innovative, right? Absolutely. I mean, we, we there are, I guess, loads of, uh, loads of examples of this. I would say uh, WhatsApp messenger service is a blue ocean, ocean strategy, right? not too many uh, options right it's it's basically being uh, being able to 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 connect and and a very very simple operation what was the company valued at after nearly 5 6 or 7 years 21 billion dollars that's that's new market uh similarly take uh, i would say uh uber or take Airbnb. All these people have; they were not competing in the traditional markets uh, market space. Yes, you could potentially say that uh, Uber is 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 competing with normal taxis. Yes, in a way it is, but they have expanded the market boundaries. You could say Airbnb is competing with uh, the ho in the hotel industry. Yes, in a way, but they have expanded the expanded the market boundaries, and this is where. In, in, in most of the instances, you could see demonetization of the industry. You know, we traditionally talk about how do you monetize an industry, and this is how you demonetize an industry because you basically take an, uh, a lot of costs out of the system and thereby you charge uh, lower prices. All right, um, going into... Um, Sony uh, with the e-reader. I can't remember Sony coming up with an e-reader at all. All I can remember is uh, Kindle and, uh, um, and and a few others who were first to enter. We don't realize that uh, Sony came with an e-reader and they very quickly again uh, became completely irrelevant to, to, the, to a reader. Yeah? And that's because, uh, Anju, can you move to the next slide, please? Yes. yes. And that be that's because it failed to attract uh, most of the, to attract the, uh, attract new customers because they did not have enough worthwhile books uh, to to offer. So until uh, Amazon came along with their Kindle uh, and offering 
easy access to books and a wide range of uh, books um, sony was sony sony was lost in its own uh, in its own uh, creation of uh, uh, their e readers next okay let's let's look at the uh, british uh, rail group here you find again uh, amazing uh, statistics uh, employee turnover significantly reduced recruitment and training costs again significantly reduced because of the first point because when you have less people leaving you know you have less recruitment and hence uh, requirement to train new newcomers customer satisfaction again uh, very high and and uh, of course uh, bottom line savings what the british group did uh, primarily here was uh, looking at uh, next slide please look looking at uh, their sort of the leadership canvas so as you can see you know some of the some of the uh, tools and concepts that we've talked about throughout uh, this presentation uh, between Andrew and myself, you can apply it primarily to uh, many of the many of the industries and to many different sectors. Here you see an example of how it's being applied to where your managers spend the most amount of time. So, so the the, the concept that you have learned here around. Uh, the strategy canvas, the, el the eliminate, reduce, raise, create, grid, uh, very similar to the BCG matrix, you can apply it to a number of situations, a number of uh, um, departments within an organization. And, and looking at what the, uh, the BRG group applied uh, it in, in the, uh, to their leadership uh, teams, when you look at what the frontline managers were supposed to focus on and what they were currently focusing on you can see where there was room for the elimination and and reduction so the frontline managers were expected to really look at look after people motivate people and make sure that uh, people performance was high on their agenda but if you look at the red line their focus primarily was very, very low on, on communication and, and looking after the frontline uh, front people. But instead, they got involved in a lot of internal, I, which I call internal business. So seeking approval for decisions, completing internal reports and forms, uh, produce uh, N amount of data for, for, for your senior managers, for reporting uh, and and differing customer queries to middle management. Now, some of that work is necessary. I'm not saying it's not necessary, but as far as the frontline managers are concerned, their focus should be on dealing with underperformance, on under, uh, on getting to know their people very 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 well, coaching the frontline uh, people uh, for successful performance, performance and uh, communicating relevant information you can also see uh, when you look go into uh, create what they were not doing and what they started doing uh, through the strategy uh, canvas was uh, celebrating and rewarding positive results uh, clarifying the company's objectives their vision and mission uh, that that uh, were relevant to uh, the frontline staff I'm sure that if we if we look at our own organizations, we can very very quickly see where we are um, in 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 terms of the leadership, and where we should be uh, as far as the different uh, segments of of your uh, leadership is concerned. So the frontline managers, the middle managers, the senior managers. Let's let's go into the next uh, slide. Now here you look at the next level of uh, managers you look at what your middle managers are uh, supposed to do and you get a, a very similar picture to to what you had with the the front line uh, and again here you you find that the middle managers were 
uh, essentially supposed to you know set performance uh, performance targets share best practices across uh, the organization uh, align and reward uh, for performance which they were not doing and and through the strategy canvas these are areas that they uh, created and if you look at uh, what they raised their the the activities that they raised were creating a safe environment for learning explaining the strategy clearly and empowering your frontline uh, to to take not only to stretch themselves but to also take decisions and spending a lot of time on coaching people so instead of initially through the red line you can see that instead of doing those things they spent a lot of time uh, on again so a lot of internal uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, activities compliance reporting justifying decisions uh, and and things like that so i will not go into uh, all the all the details but you can see uh, on on where particularly where they have raised their bar and the new activities that they have created you can see where they um, they have again outperformed uh, their competition in in a way because uh, you have other companies which are probably still doing what the red line is doing and here they have set themselves uh, completely apart in, in terms of uh, how they manage their manage their staff and their leadership behaviors it's interesting to see how you know, how the red line it says control and play safe isn't it control and play safe and then you know that creativity is out you actually just playing safe not being innovative isn't it absolutely so if you take uh, for example what i could think uh, in terms of mid level managers and frontline managers is uh, zappos mm -hmm. uh, few years ago zappos was an online um, a shoe uh, shoe company selling shoes online um, i would have never thought zappos would be successful i thought who would ever want to buy a pair of shoes online you would want to go to a store try it on zappos had zero sales and today it is over a billion dollars in sales and primarily achieved through i had the i had the the great honor of uh, meeting the ceo of uh, of zappos uh, in in new york once and i asked him what what do you attribute your success story to he said empowering your people so what do you mean by empowering your people the frontline people who answer a call from a customer asking for a pair of shoes they had absolute authority and they were empowered to do whatever that was necessary to satisfy the customer and when i say whatever was required you know it, it's a bit of a stretch but if uh, they spoke to a customer and and there is a case of where a lady spoke to and and she just wanted to talk to somebody she had had a bad day and they the the frontline staff could send her a bunch of flowers if somebody complained with uh, the shoes not being what she thought it was it could they could return it free of charge uh, even the postage or, or the courier service was was paid for so so you can see here both in the middle uh, management and the frontline managers you could see that most of it was around how do you focus how do you motivate how do you communicate and how do you raise the performance bar of your own staff and that's exactly what zappos did all right so going into the next bracket of uh, of uh, leadership is the senior managers these are people who are basically setting a uh, strategy looking at industry trends looking at how to take your company from where it is today uh, to the to the next level so instead of doing that which you see through the through the uh, blue line they were more uh, entrenched in enforcing uh their ways of the existing ways of doing things uh completely engrossed in putting out fires monitoring and coordinating the work 
of different people and dealing with a lot of administrative uh, issues. So here you can see through the through the blue line how they eliminated, reduced some of those things that didn't add value and raised their bar on the things that really mattered and really brought value to the, to the organization. So what you've seen in the last few slides is indeed an application of uh, the uh, blue ocean strategy and as you can see it is it is very robust it's it's a robust uh, set of tools can be applied to any industry can be applied to different departments in in the same uh, in, in an organization um, and it is portable across industries that's the beauty of this uh, of this strategy however because as Anju mentioned before it is uh, it's a different mindset it's a different cup of tea it's a different way of thinking it's it's a lot of existing organizations find it difficult to break out of their current way of thinking their current way of setting strategy their current way of setting and vision a current way of competing in the market because what you don't know you don't know and, and that's exactly why this is diff difficult. As Andrew mentioned, this was this came into the market in 2004, 2005. It's been 11, 12 years. Um, and the companies which have sort of uh, taken this on and uh, implemented this have been extremely successful, but some have also struggled uh, to uh, move from a red ocean strategy into a blue ocean strategy. Uh, primarily because uh, it is not easy. So again, a quick uh, recap of uh, one one before uh, Andrew. Yeah. So again, a quick recap of uh, what we uh, uh, talked about earlier. And this is again. So red ocean strategy. You are looking at competing in existing markets. On the blue ocean side, we try to create new markets. And, and new customers to serve. Uh, on the Red Ocean strategy, we talk about beating your existing competition. And in the Blue Ocean strategy, you're talking about making com existing competition irrelevant. Red Ocean strategy, exploit existing demand. Blue Ocean strategy, create and capture new demand. Red Ocean, make the value cost trade-off. Uh, and on the Blue Ocean strategy, is breaking that value cost uh, trade-off and we, we you know we talked about this value cost trade-off this is an important piece it's about what value are you adding to your customers and at what cost can you reduce your cost where when when something doesn't really add value to your your customers and finally um, you need to align uh, the firm's activities with these strategies uh, uh, and, and and choices and the beauty of the blue ocean strategy is that it does uh, your execution is part of the uh, uh, part of the strategy. So very quickly uh, recapping, look across alternative industries, look across strategic groups. Uh, so when I say when we look when we talk about a strategic group, that is for example, BMW, Mercedes, and Jaguar. That is a strategic group. They are all competing in the luxury car uh, luxury car market. Uh, look across chain of buyers, look across complementary products and services, you know, we, we talked about that, and look across um, uh, time. So leaving you, uh, on my part, uh, leaving we, you with uh, two uh, key things. Again, six key points that we learned through this. Differentiation and low cost, creates uncontested market space, builds executions, uh, execution into your strategy, you break your value cost trade-off, make competition irrelevant, create and capture new demand. That's, that's the mantra of, of the Blue Ocean strategy. Leaving you with some homework, 
I think I got really excited with this slide, Kasun, because this is kind of my favorite slide because it's very personal and it's kind of how do you apply this blue ocean to yourself. And basically, especially during this time when the market is quite tight, the employment you know, opportunities is very difficult for people. Everyone is kind of quite anxious. So Kasun, give us some homework. I thought you were going to take this one. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I, I mean, really, if you are looking for um, looking for, for a job, Kasun, I mean, this is kind of very, um, you know, what if I'm looking for a job and I say, okay, how many, like, let's say, all of us are accountants here, and well, we are competing with all accountants, isn't it? So yeah. then it is, you know, how do we stand out? How do we create that, go into that market and showcase, well, look at me. I'm, I've got a lot of other skills, right? How do I showcase that? The first point Absolutely. talks about this, you know, strategy shapes proactive action. I think a lot of, a lot of accountants are also uh, introvert one piece of advice is be an extrovert and start you know blogging build your networks how do you build networks philanthropy join some philanthropic groups social media right and create that kind of network well join link up with us link up with kasun and i on linkedin right and you know we create those networks yeah so that's one way of getting to know uh, others and also socializing proactive action right that's important and what about the second point kasun i know this transferable skills is one of your key points i know you've got a lot to tell about that yeah so here i mean if we <clears throat> if we look at uh, some most of the times we underestimate the skills that we have the uh, if you have been say for example a president of uh, of an organization of, of a non-profit organization we underplay that because that was back in uh, back in the university so we don't we don't play that up but if you look across your uh, entire career from your days in school to where you are now there are loads of skills you now sit down and if you really start writing them down you can see what a lot of skills that you have that you can make a quick differentiation in terms of uh, in terms of how you uh, compete with with others uh, when you go for a job i'll give you an example of uh, of one of these things that i really leveraged um, was uh, i grew up in uh, i grew up in africa because my father used to work in africa and uh, when I joined Shell and Downstream, there was a job that I really, really wanted. It was in Downstream. It was uh, looking after about 18 countries in planning, in, in the strategy and planning space and, and performance management. And uh, of course, we are 100,000 people, of which about 11,000 people are in finance. And uh, say even if 10% of those people applied for the job or was interested in that job, that's quite a lot of people that I had to compete with. And I looked around and I said, what is it that, and one of the patches that I had to manage in this role was Africa. And the other patch was Middle East and South Asia. So I used my experience of growing up in Africa to say, I know these people, I can link up with the people, I understand their culture, I can communicate with them. And, and that's how I differentiated myself from um, the rest of uh, the people who were also interested in the, in, in the job uh, to, to actually land the job, which I, which I really enjoyed. Thank you, Kasun. That's, that's really interesting and a very good point. And the third point talks about uh, carry out a SWOT on a target company. You know, you, you are targeting a company, so obviously you need to look at you know, what are they, just don't read the job description, read more than the job description, 
look at the company what are they going through are you able to add uh, your experience your skills and augment this company right is there a possibility if you know they're going they are about to go through a transformation you know transition transformation you must have some experience in the past maybe it's not there in the in the job description it's not there at all but doing your SWOT analysis you find this information from your contacts you find this information and then you're able to talk about your key um, some of the key transferable skills that you can bring it to this organization right and the last point is quite interesting saying get paid more than market value that's i love the point don't be shy you can earn much more than the market price sometimes we don't ask the right question sometimes we don't negotiate and when we're negotiating you're negotiating not on what x has but what do i bring to the table right you would be bringing to the table like kasoon mentioned your experience right working in different parts of the world the difficult situations that you have gone through the disasters you have faced in certain companies certain projects these are all very good learning experiences that a company would love to have without themselves going through it but getting your knowledge right anything that you want to add kasoon before we end tonight yeah so i been spending a bit of time trying to draw my strategy canvas right in in so i'll just share that with you i'm not saying that that's the the, the only way to do it but it's just my experience um so i looked at the, what does my company in my current role look at yeah how do i make sure that again i'm looking at an existing role how do i overperform in my existing role for me to be even considered for future uh, future promotions and uh, i realized that uh, i had around eight key uh, parameters or key factors uh, that the organization was really interested in so i identi- i sat down and identified this and i'll share it with you uh, it's ability to execute so your execution capability so my execution capability we have a lot of people in organizations who can think strategy who can think long term who can come up with ideas but execution um, just just doesn't work uh, so i said execution is extremely important big picture thinking how do i connect the dots can i see the bigger picture can i you know go to 10000 feet and see how the organization functions third one networking do, do i move around with people can i can i get on with people do i know the right people uh, creative thinking uh, developing my staff which is which is extremely important in in the role that i am uh, can i analyze uh, trend can i ca- trends can i just automatically see trends uh, in 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 the in the area of work that i do uh, do i have analytical skills can i improve uh, my processes and 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 the work that i'm doing on a continuous basis so i took these eight uh, or so um, critical success factors which i call uh, for my existing role and i said so how am i doing on each of these factors right now and then i went to my boss and said you know these are things i think are important to you mention you mentioned this to me uh, several times during our feedback sessions so this is how i see myself this is where i am currently mapped where do you want me to be and that was really a a a, a excellent discussion that i had with my boss so i just wanted to to sort of put that on the table uh, and uh, and share my experience thank you kasoon that's that's really quite informative and i think that's the kind of uh thing that all of us should do sit down and think of you know what are the key um transferable skills that we've got and what you've just mentioned can not only work in shell or anywhere else as well that's the beauty isn't it and that's where you market yourself based on those key skills so we come to the end of today's session brought to you by ultimate access 
and uh, in collaboration with Sima. Great to have you guys. And if you want to connect with us, both myself, Andrew Dialwis, and Kasun uh, Abiwadana on LinkedIn. And we'll be really glad to have your connections. And um, good night, and hope you had a great session tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kasun. Pleasure.